Hey everyone, welcome to our DevOps Office Hours. It is June 28th, 2023. My name's Eric Osterman and I'll be your host. I'm the founder and CEO of Cloud Posse. Cloud Posse helps teams conquer AWS using our rock solid AWS blueprints for Terraform. Whether you're starting from scratch or just not satisfied with your current setup, book a session with me directly by going to cloudposse.com slash quiz. Again, cloudposse.com slash quiz, answer a few quick questions, and we'll have a call to show how your team will succeed. For those of you new to the call, the format is informal. My goal is to answer your questions. If you're curious about Cloud Posse or any of our open source tools and modules, this is a great place to ask. For those of us joining through the podcast or YouTube channel, we host these calls live every week. Uh, you can register for them by going to cloudposse.com slash office hours. Again, that's cloudposse.com slash office hours. Our call today is recorded. We'll post a recording of the session to our YouTube channel. So if you want to support what we do and uh, uh, help us out, hit those like and subscribe buttons. Uh, that helps us gain uh, you know, wonderful members as everyone here today. So that said, let's uh, go to announcements. All right, so a few things here. I had less time to prepare today, so I haven't gone as deep on any one of these. Um, also, that means I'm really curious to hear if anyone else has and has any testimonials or uh, things to add to it. So I had the exciting opportunity today to meet one of our community members here in Houston. Uh, we went out for coffee this morning, and he turned me on to this tool called Changey. Uh, Changey seems like a GitOps friendly way of managing semantic versions and change logs through files uh, that you commit. And then there's a CLI component of it that will help um, tie it all together, cut the release based on the types of changes and um, merge, uh, uh, merge some of the uh, individual stub files that it creates into a release notes. Has anybody seen Changey before? Nope. All right. So let's see here. Next one is, um, next announcement was uh, by Matt Gowie at uh, Masterpoint. Um, Matt, are you here today? You might not have been able to make it, but I, I thought it was great. Matt finally got a chance to write up uh, their experience doing a POC with Crossplane. Um, that can mean a couple of things. Like the worst is when you see a POC where it ends in success, uh, very short, and it's like a recommendation to go to production. Um, the next best thing is a POC that had a failure but shows and or explains why specifically they ran into those uh, problems. So uh, their POC didn't work out that well for them, but I thought it was an interesting um, breakdown of some, he, it, it's kind of fair and balanced in the sense like, you know, why they went into this uh, with great optimism, uh, you know, why conceptually they want this to succeed, but the reality of the POC and the challenges they uh, faced uh, along the way. Uh, namely, a pretty obtuse uh, YAML schema uh, that required quite a lot of configuration to get right. Uh, along with that came the uh, learning curve and debug complexity, which was reduced to kubectl get events, which isn't maybe the best uh, way uh, to get started on the, the, the product. Also, like he points out, kubectl get events isn't going to scale with a busy cross-plane platform. Um, I think it'll help you get your POC off the ground, but I don't know uh, more than that. So uh, other surprises were limited resource support. Some of the things that they wanted to be able to do, um, they uh, couldn't yet achieve. Um, and some challenges, uh, perhaps integrating with uh, some of the Terraform uh, code that they already had, incidentally leveraging some Cloud Posse uh, modules as well. So we'll share this link as well after. Uh, it, I think it's an interesting read for anybody who, as myself, has you know, lots of FOMO with Crossplane, um, but from experience and battle scars, kind of practicing some uh, temperance and not jumping on it. 
Also very curious if anyone has counter arguments to any of these things. Uh, I want to I want to hear those as well. All right. Uh, next announcement was um, something that was just in my LinkedIn feed, uh, an end-to-end -end demo uh, for EKS using Lattice and the new Lattice controller. Uh, Lattice is uh, one of the most exciting announcements to come to AWS networking since the introduction of VPCs, in my mind. Lattice allows you to create an AWS-managed overlay network, mitigating the need for something like a transit gateway for certain use cases, uh, and allowing you not to worry about, therefore, proper subnet allocations in all of your AWS accounts, because Lattice solves the issue of overlapping um, subnets in your accounts, because you don't actually need to peer them. Has anybody already been playing with Lattice? Or more than play? All right, that's a bummer, but yeah. We haven't yet had a chance to do a POC on this. I want to do that. It's super, super early. Like I, it's the future, but the, so they use the gateway API load balancer for Kubernetes and their implementation is in alpha. Um, and yeah, uh, it's, there's a lot of opportunity there. And it, I agree, it is the future of networking on AWS and they're doing a bunch of fascinating things, but it's it's i wouldn't i would play around with it definitely i wouldn't put it in production just yet but okay. for folks that wanna let me find the repository this is the but for folks that have some time yeah play around with it it's yeah that's it it's gonna be awesome in the future not now oh i was linking to the aws implementation of the kubernetes gateway api yeah, like, there are things missing. It's it wasn't ready. Lattice itself is missing a couple of things, but it's maturing and it's growing super fast. And Kubernetes is actually pretty well supported. Like the ECS integration is being worked on. There's nothing available. It supports raw EC2 and lambdas. And I just complain on one thing. I was so happy that they had this new repo for AWS controllers by AWS. I presume by AWS. And now they launched a new controller and it's not in the controller repository. Because or those controllers are for the ACK, which is their version kind of is not really of crossplay. Right. Okay. Yeah. And this couldn't be kind of considered like a lattice. Like, I mean, the way this no, is- Don't try Martin to make Jack sense of AWS's three. naming. No, there's only pain there. Uh, yeah, I guess pain, but I don't know. As an end user, it's Lattice. As an end user, it's S3. I don't know if I can distinguish. All right, sorry. And rant. Um, so this is uh, the controller that they're working on. Um, that uses is that uh, gateway API. I'm not familiar with the gateway API. How familiar are you with it, um, Vlad, or anyone else? It's basically Ingress version three. Oh, huh. So like that's the easiest way to think of it. Yeah. Could you say almost like this would encapsulate Ingress? So Ingress would be like some type underneath this? Or, or I guess, okay, so it encapsulates service, TCP route, HTTP route. It's, it's a high, it's a like higher Ingress. level. Um, where, where you see this already is um, uh, like Istio had Istio gateways, and yeah. they had their own uh, custom resources for that. Yeah. Uh, and newer versions of Istio are using the, the Kubernetes native gateway function. Uh -huh. So that's cool. All right. Learn something new every day. Uh, so much bad news about LastPass is kind of boring to announce, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. Yeah, another <laughs> issue with LastPass, I guess a bunch of users uh, were locked out um, uh, due to MFA resets. Not sure what the underlying cause of that one was. Here was something I came across by accident, I believe. Um, I mistyped, oh, dispatch.com. 
CO with dispatch.do and landed on this. Um, so here is a interesting uh, startup. I don't know anybody you know using Gmail. There's been probably a dozen or more startups around a native, better Gmail experience for like practicing inbox zero. Well, I guess Slack is now big enough that they're getting their own startup, building a better UI for Slack using the Slack API so you can stay on top of the information overload that is Slack and all the channels we're in. I haven't kicked it out, uh, kicked the tires yet myself. Matt Calhoun on the team has, but he's out of the office today, so can't share uh, his experience with it yet. Curious if anyone else is using it. No, but I'd love to have one for Wecom. Wecom. It's the business version of WeChat. Oh, really? Oh, okay. Wait, you said you would love to have one for Wecom, yes. or there is one. Okay. No, no, I would like to have this for Wecom. Yeah. Well, I would love to have this. Oh, sorry, Ralph. You know I understand what? the sentiment why it was built. Yeah. I what I would love uh, from my perspective uh, is something. <laughs> oh, what was it called? I can't even remember what it was called. It's been 15 years ago since I used them. Trillion? Do you remember Trillion? Anyone? Um, like when there were all these different IRC servers and ICQ and MSN Messenger and Skype, it was such a pain in the ass to connect with everyone. So you had Trillion. Um, so oh, I remember that. So for a while, I, I we've been, I, speaking just personally. I've been on Slack now, it, you know, for since inception basically, and forgot about all these other problems, um, uh, hip chat and whatever were which were brief lived things. But now we're back to it. And I need it for AWS Chime. I need it for MS Teams. I need it for Slack. And that would make my communi business communication a whole lot easier. I'd love to see somebody that could tie those together. Oh, uh, Martin, are you talking to us? I don't know. Um, uh, you're muted. Okay. I'm curious how many of you think you've used more than 100 of these kinds of products? More than 100 here. Slack. So, yeah, like chat platforms. So, so, I'm thinking I used to use Dialpad and Powwow and uh, IRC. And so, I once actually took the time to count together how many of these instant message products I've used personally for work and for work. And I got to over 100. Hmm. I uh, have not enumerated them, but that sounds horrible. <laughs> a hor a hundred ways that somebody can distract you, uh, control your uh, conscious mind, whatever you're doing at the moment. This is interesting. Uh, uh, Martin, can you tell me about this? Have you used it or how did you hear yeah, about Franz? I, I used it for a while when, when there was... Uh... Uh, part of us using Zoom and Slack, and then I had also Microsoft Office and Gmail. So I mm -hmm. used this, but now we are back to Slack only. So, um, but in the past, I was happy with this one. Okay. That's cool. I will have to check this out. Um, yeah. See the next announcement, or was there any uh, anything else on that? No. Nope. Okay. Next announcement. Uh, yeah, public service announcement here. Um, it's affected uh, every customer we have, and um, probably some that we don't know about. Um, if you're using GitHub Actions and they started failing with GitHub OIDC for some reason, sporadically and randomly, frustratingly, it's probably because uh, only one of the two thumbprints was uh, authorized um, to work with actions. Um, so just adding the other one fixes it. If you do use our uh, Terraform component for that, uh, we also upstreamed a pull request that fixed that last night. Um, just upgrade the component and it should start working for you. Uh, yeah, GitHub had a, uh, what was it? Uh, they don't post what the error message is, but you'll know if you have it. Um, 
here's something somebody can fill me in on. I don't know how I missed such a significant part of Terraform 1.5's announcements. Um, I think because when I saw import, I said, okay, yeah, yeah, I know about import, moving on. There's a actual import block now within uh, HCL that um, will, I, and this is the part I was a little bit um, confused. It says Terraform produces HCL to act as a template that contains uh, Terraform's best guess at the appropriate value for each resource argument. Is this like a ephemeral resource that it generates like at runtime? I don't, it doesn't sound like it actually writes it to disk, but I'm, I'm confused about this and how this works. And if it is writing it to disk, how in the world that would work in a GitOps uh, methodology? Please, somebody, I nobody think there knows. was a... Terra something project that did this before. Yeah, Terraformer, Terraform. like well, at least one other one. Terraformer was by Google. Um, Microsoft came out with one that was impossible to remember the name of. Um, I think they were going to rename it, but but this is now some kind of native support for importing the actual resource uh construct oh mike percival shares yeah the, the other one was called terra cognito i think that was the one by um at microsoft i think this makes terraform infinitely more implementable if you already have infrastructure oh cyclidio is the terra cognita so i got that one wrong yeah yeah uh and that's the argument they make in, in this announcement if i can find my tab again uh, but yeah, it solves a big problem, especially for shops that don't have the privilege of starting fresh, right? Um, we, as a company, really don't like to work in place with existing uh, resources deployed by ClickOps, but yeah. All right. Uh, next announcement, something I saw in the weekly TF newsletter. It's another uh, wrapper for Terraform, uh, an orchestrator. Uh, suited for mono repos, so similar to Atmos, supposed I presumably um, in that sense. Haven't looked at it, um, but yeah, they have their own uh, opinionated way of or organizing your infrastructure, and looks like they adopted um, HCL as the uh, configuration language as well for it. So similar, therefore, to Terra Grunt, Terra Mate, and now Terra Scope. Lastly, something I saw immediately before office hours was a post uh, by OpenAI uh, on scaling Kubernetes to 7,500 nodes. These are always fun uh, to learn about uh, the challenges they ran into at uh, certain scales when things break that you didn't realize would break. We'll uh, share more maybe if we I get a chance to dig into that. So I wanted to get to this question by somebody I know on the call here, Martin. <laughs> um, uh, let's see, I don't know if we have uh, some of the folks that have been regulars on talking about compliance um, here. Yeah, yeah honestly, I, I don't know how well, to- Sean Roberts it. might know the answer to one of these. He's been, I think, uh, pretty vocal. Uh, let me read the question. Uh, anyone have experience with audit logging and anomaly detection on EKS uh, who is willing to share their experience? Uh, and anything else you want to add to that, Matt, uh, Martin? I mean, it's hard to formulate it in one question, right? Yeah. So we have this problem. We want to get SOC 2 compliance. And they basically say, yeah, you have to have an automated way to analyze your logs and to find anomalies for vulnerabilities and 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 so on intruder detection and well, SOC 2 wouldn't say that would it because what, it's just an audit framework what right? they just said what they just said though is conflicting with their statement so vulnerabilities are vulnerabilities not anomalies they are vulnerabilities so that, yeah, yeah, yeah yeah but you have to start somewhere so um what I'm, what I'm saying is yeah as long as they don't they're not saying an anomaly is a vulnerability um in general when people say anomaly detection they for the most part, they don't know what they're talking about. Um, my experience. I I, uh, I agree. I agree with you. It's the same 
uh, what is the correlation and a, and a, and a causality. Um, okay, but but let me let me start fresh. Okay, we we should prove that we have some automated way to detect vulnerabilities um, on our log files for the application and for our infrastructure. And of course, the CloudWatch uh, has everything in. Uh, yeah, is available in Amazon, and we have Datadog for all the other log management. And I wanted I wanted to activate the SIEM stuff in Datadog to do it, and therefore transfer transfer the relevant logs to Datadog. And I started with it, and it, it turned out this is a pretty expensive way to do it because of all paying the traffic, paying Datadog. Um, whoever started with it uh, knows the stuff, and. So I started rethinking if if this is the right track and 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 yeah I don't know uh, who to talk to and share share some experience and ideas about this stuff. I, so, I don't know an open source vendor uh, or like an open source completely open source product that has the there's plenty that have the ability, but ones that have the rules the rules are the hard part. And that's what Datadog is saying, where they have rule, automatic rules for certain things. Yeah, they already have a bunch of rules, right? But the yeah. same as for guard duty on Amazon, they have probably different, the uh, same rules. Same thing for Splunk, they have some rules. So you have to see if there's a vendor that fits in with inside your cost. And then if you, if you find a way to do it without paying a, a, a vendor tons of money or spending, <laughs> dedicating someone's job to writing rules, I'd love to hear it. <laughs> we, yeah, I mean, every what what was Brian? I was saying we actually use Wazoo. That's what he's looking at right now. Oh, okay, I'll share it in the chat. It it, it does it does quite a bit because um, we we had the same problem when looking at the cloud seam because you have to pay you pay the agent host and then you got the cloud seam which is like it was like double the cost so you're paying yeah. like thirty dollars per per host to do the cloud seam and it, 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 like you said data dog side it, it it does a really good job but it's just extremely costly. Yeah, exactly. I wouldn't mind per I wouldn't mind per host. The the data dog is per uh, data amount, which that's that's. Uh, well, and they both. have different. No, they have different things. You yeah. you you some parts you pay for host, and some you per per gigabyte log, and some you pay per number of events. Yep. So so and if you enable all, you are around at thirty dollars per host. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah that, and that's where it gets ridiculous, in my opinion, for data dog. Hmm. We and we we were avid users of data dog as well. And like I said, their 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 anomaly stuff is really good. They're, they're, the cloud security stuff is really good, but um, we've been, like we on the FedRAMP side, we were doing everything pretty much inside of AWS for the most part, and trying to use most of the AWS tools with Detective Guard Duty and things like that, um, trying to keep up on the security side. Yeah, uh, and has someone tried this tool called Guard Duty? We we used Guard Duty, yeah. Are you happy with it? Is it okay? Is it sufficient? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it does a really good job as finding finding stuff while it's happening and different attacks. And that's that's built into AWS. Exactly. And you can you can um transfer or forward the logs to Datadog and then yeah. react there. Yeah. I mean, yeah, okay. Yeah, and some of the ways that um Datadog recommends to on the log side is keep your ingestion way down. So that like mm -hmm. keep your hot storage down to like maybe seven days. And then use their built-in archiver to archive all your active logs off to um, S3, and because chances are, you're, if you're if something's happening, you're going to catch it when it's happening. But if you need to go back and look at something, you can always rehydrate. So that yeah. way, you're, you're you're not keeping all your logs into hot storage where it's extremely costly. Keep yeah, it makes sense. Like a week's worth in there, and then archive the rest of it to S3, and then rehydrate whenever needed. And that'll cut down costs quite a bit. Yeah, the other cost thing that always that got us is we we have our own logging platform, so we don't we don't really use CloudWatch directly, but all of our logs are being funneled through CloudWatch. Some have to be by default, but like all our container logs were, we chose to do that because it was easy. But then we were we were paying for the logs going through CloudWatch, which we're not even querying, and then again paying for the place we were landing them. So we changed yeah. that model to not, to not go for anything that doesn't have to. It doesn't go to CloudWatch, so, so they're not paying. At, at one point, that was like seventy percent of our entire budget just CloudWatch alone. Yeah. So yeah, we were sending a lot of stuff to um, Open Search using uh, Kinesis Firehose to split it. Yeah, and so we were using TD Agent to send the, send a lot of the logs to Firehose, and then Firehose sent them to S3 automatically and to the Elasticsearch. So yeah, we have a similar. We have a, we have a similar pattern now. Yeah. So and that that reduced our. Yeah, that reduced our our cloud budget for some of our control planes by like sixty percent. Yeah, and then that range. and then you can you can utilize the uh, the the stuff inside of uh, Open Search 
to do all your anomaly detection things like that as well uh -huh. and they've in so the I'll newer version they've got quite a bit of, they got a decent security package with it too can can you post those names uh just in the chat um so that i can remember yeah would be cool yeah. and and sean how can i bypass cloudwatch well, it depends what it is. If you're talking the pure EKS logs themselves, not your container logs, or the you know the, def the default one that's there, yes. um, that that one you can't right now. However, when I last okay. met when I last met a couple months ago with the EKS uh, product managers, they they did say that that you know they are working on so you can write directly to S3 instead because some people want S3 as their or, or Kinesis, they want that as their their processing, right? They don't like that some services can write Kinesis and some can't. So they are gonna change that. But right now that has to go to CloudWatch. However, for, for us, that's tiny compared to our container logs. And container logs, you have to set up yourself. There's no, it's not on by default. You either use a CloudWatch agent, TD agent, Fluent Bit, whatever. That's the one that we shifted to bypass and not use CloudWatch as the, as the place because it didn't have to go there. Yeah, and that's what we did too. We used Fluent Bit and TD agent to send to Kinesis. Yeah, Evan, uh, this is this is also what I'm thinking. I mean, having the check mark is easy by enabling Seam on some uh, some data. Then Drada is happy, or our compliance uh, partner. Um, but from an SRE perspective, I, I want to do it right. Yeah, the, and then and then the built-in stuff with with AWS. If everything is in AWS and it's on EC2 instances, then they have really good uh, cloud security, cloud posturing as far as vulnerability scanning. Uh, CIS compliance and things like that. If not, then Wazoo <clears throat> is a good one to use. <laughs> It'll scan all of your all your host find vulnerabilities, and you can report on that as well. Mm. Okay. Well, I think I have some stuff to read. Yeah, and then with Wazoo, there's there's a ways you can actually, like you can you can take all your uh, VPC flow logs, cloud trail config logs, and all that, import them into Wazoo. And then actually process those with Wazoo and get a dashboard as well. And which and and uh, Wazoo now uses so they've forked um, uh, Open Search and they've forked uh, Kibana. So they have the Wazoo indexer, and then they have their own Wazoo dashboard. Why did they need to fork? Say so what? Do you know why they needed to fork? Um, I th I don't know why they actually forked it. Um, so. Just, just so everyone knows, um, Wazoo itself is a fork of um, OSSEC. Oh, and so they forked from that and created Wazoo, and so they've they have they have it's actually they have a really good support. Um, if you actually pay for the support, they're very responsive, um, very good to work with. Um, and then I don't know why they actually ended up forking from um, Open Search and uh, and Kibana, other than I think they did it just for like maybe their branding and things like that. Because they're 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 changing up dashboards and things and, and some stuff just trying to make it a little bit better. Well, there were li there were also license changes. Yeah, so. I think a lot of it probably had to do with more licensing too. Oh yeah, yeah. Last year, Amazon had to do some stuff with Elastic's license. Yeah, that's like, when well. they came out with Open Search. Yeah, yeah, because of Elastic. <clears throat> and uh, I hadn't heard about this. Someone shared a TD agent Brian Polly. Uh, what is um, how is that different, like from Fluent? Bit. It's it's all the same same owner same people, okay. It's just different different flavor versions of it, different lightweight and. Okay, so no association with this Treasure Data company. Well, Treasure, like... Treasure Data is Fluent D. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So they are. But, so, but Fluent D is a beast. So unless yeah. you have to use Fluent Bit, not Fluent D. Oh. Even they even the maintainers will tell you use Fluent Bit, right. not Fluent. D. You absolutely yeah. have. You can kind of scale it up as you need it, uh, but it gives you the ability to send data a lot of different ways. Which is great. So uh, Fluent D is the original one that was in like uh, Ruby or something. Yep. Fluent Bit was the one rewritten in like C or something. And TD Client is that rewritten in Go or is that still in Python or Ruby or something? I think there's different versions of it. Oh, interesting. Oh, yeah, TD Client Ruby, TD Client Go. Okay. All right. Uh, anyone have anything else uh, more to add to that before we get to uh, another question? Did you have a follow-up question on that one, Martin? 
Well, I, I, I had I had this thread, so I was wondering why I cannot um, um, configure the, the audit lock in, in the EKS clusters. And there is an ongoing thread from 2018 that says, yeah, it's not possible with MSN. And is it right? I mean, that I can, for example, just say, don't lock things from this particular service because we trust it. My assumption is that it's on the control plane and that's why they're not exposing that level of granularity or configuration, but. I don't know. Yeah, I'm, because like 30% of the cluster locks or the audit locks are Carpenter things, I think. <laughs> uh, well, Carpenter uh, verbosity can be reduced. Have we looked? Is no, it... not not yet. I, I just wanted, I mean, I know that you can, if you have your own, AK, uh, your own Kubernetes cluster, then you can write this audit config and you can mm -hmm. say, ah, um, don't lock for Carpenter or don't lock for this service. Mm -hmm. But I haven't found this option in ECAS. Yeah. All right. Thanks for that question. Thanks everyone for helping answer it. Uh, any uh, any other questions we can get answered today? I, I have no more announcements. I got nothing else. So I rely on you guys for Q and A material. Any any uh, questions? Does, did we discuss number four? Did I'm I just skip one? I'm just curious about what. Oh, I think I did skip that one. Sorry. Yeah, go on. Oh, I'm just curious about what you consider to be um, a good workflow for for reviewing and testing deployments of, of Terraform code. I'm, I'm just a student. I was just curious. I see your modules on the registry, and I thought it'd be an interesting opportunity to ask someone who works with Terraform every day. Yeah, um, I'd be happy to answer the question first, though. Any uh, Anyone else want to take this one first uh, before I uh, chime in? All right, so testing and Terraform. Big question, of course. Uh, I'll try and uh, break it in half. Um, so first thing to get clear is that you have two different types of uh, Terraform modules uh, in, when you're using Terraform at any reasonable scale. So the first one is the one that everyone's familiar with, like you see on my screen, our EFS backup module, null label, AWS NLB, and so forth. The other thing that you'll probably have doing Terraform at scale are root modules. We call them components. And we call them components because ours are opinionated in a way that we like them to work. And components are slightly different. Components have Terraform state. They call child modules. And they're often what you are deploying in your environments. So the easiest thing in the world to test are probably regular Terraform uh, modules themselves. And there's pretty much one de facto tool out there that rules them all at this stage. Uh, and that is something called, um, what am I looking at here? Why, of all the things I pull up, why am I pulling up something that doesn't have a test folder? I don't know about that. Nana, can you... Uh, <laughs> Or Jeremy, can you remind me to look into that, why that uh, repo is missing tests? Uh, none of our repos should miss tests. Um, all right, so uh, here's a NLB component, a module. Uh, this module is actually contributed by uh, an open source community member. Uh, somebody uh, uh, created this based on some of our other modules. So Terraform has some basic testing built in, but it's not really what's going to uh, help you manage infrastructure at scale. And for that, the tool is TerraTest. Uh, TerraTest uh, is by a company called Gruntwork. Uh, they built it to test their own infrastructure. And while it's called TerraTest, implying that it's only for Terraform, it's really a generic infrastructure test framework built in Go that allows you to call commands 
verify the output and um, ensure that you know things uh, function as you would expect. And it can do that in parallel and it can help you clean up afterwards and so forth. So testing on uh, Terraform is, you know, in an ideal world, you would have test coverage um, that is thorough on everything that your module is provisioning with exception of the underlying resources. For example, Terraform itself has tests, testing like when a bucket, when you use a bucket resource, you should get a bucket. It would be stupid in your Terraform testing, in my opinion, to retest or validate that after calling a module that you got a bucket. Um, because you're just duplicating test functionality at the core. Instead, verifying that your Terraform code delivers on the use case that it's trying to solve. That said, that is still a lot to ask uh, for an open source community to uh, contribute all those tests and so forth. So currently our bar, our minimum standard, follows the Pareto 80-20 principle. If you can plan a module and you can apply a module and you can destroy a module, it catches 80% of the bugs, except for not the 20% that you know, you're, you're gonna pay for later on uh, when you wish you had tests for those. And what we do in those cases is we add those case by case when we run into them uh, to try and catch those. So the reason why it's so important to test on Terraform modules, plan, apply, and destroy, is very frequently plan and apply work, but changes to the code break destroy. And we've run into that so often in something else that we do, which are our Terraform root modules. That's probably a perfect segue to the next type of testing to get into. But before I do, any questions on, more specific questions just on testing modules? Well, I'm super curious how, let's say you wanted to test that a bucket had a certain policy associated with it. And I've, I've got to teach myself how uh, this tool, TerraTest, and, and see yeah. <laughs> how, how would I pull yeah. that information? Is that a data block? Is that a TerraTest test in, in their library? So go? yeah, it'd be written in Go. And that is the barrier to entry and testing and why so few open source modules and module um, creators actually have tests. Uh, is it raises the bar considerably going from just, yeah, I can write HCL to, yeah, I can write Golang and I, and I know how to uh, test and validate all these things. And they can get pretty hairy. Um, the problem is that it is actually hairy. There is a lot that you need in order to thoroughly validate something in AWS does what you want it to do. And in some cases, you know, ter like for example, TerraTest was written, TerraTest can SSH into a box and verify that certain files exist and certain processes are running and so forth. Um, so I see it more like it's a uh, progression in your journey towards infrastructure as code and as an organization. Uh, you're not gonna pull it off in the beginning, but look, you got enough things to, um, enough fires to fight uh, to, to worry about it. Uh, Vlad uh, po points out, uh, in his opinion, most Terraform testing either does not make sense or is not worth it. So yeah, here's where it does make sense. So I think there's in different contexts, like use cases. So, you know, Cloud Posse, we're a relatively small company, right? Uh, and we maintain 500 plus repositories, 200 are uh, for Terraform. And we could not conceivably accept any third party pull requests if we didn't at least verify that they plan and apply and destroy because it is so frequent that developers overestimate how often their minor one character change, ah, this is not gonna break anything. This is just what you know it's supposed to be. And sure as shit, it doesn't work. So, uh, so, so we started to scale when we had tests. We did not scale before that. It was literally our, like we're talking, we're going back to like 2018 at this point, but in 2018, that's what we'd have to do as maintainers. We check out your pull request. We try and plan it in between, you know, 10 other projects and see that it works. And that doesn't work. So at a company now, 
Are you a one-man shop? I agree entirely with Vlad. Are you a two-man shop? Still probably no problem. Are you a 15-person, 20-person, 30-person shop contributing to the same code base that happens to be infrastructure as code? Well, if you have GitOps, which I'll get to next, that can maybe uh, fulfill the need for testing for right now until you have more thorough tests. So um, GitOps. So the next challenge that we have is our Terraform root modules. This gets more complicated pretty quickly. So, well, let, let me jump back um, a little bit here. So modules are pretty nice because a well-built module does one thing pretty well, but the scope is limited. They tend to operate within one AWS account. They tend to have minimal feature flags. Now, this is not true of all modules. You'll see modules out there with 200, 300 variable inputs. And guess what? Those are also the same modules that have zero tests. And uh, there's a very popular organization out there with modules like that. Okay, rant aside. What you do in the case of an NLB, when we look at the tests and we look at the examples, uh, is we have to do a few things here. How do you test an NLB if you don't have a VPC, if you don't have subnets? So as part of your test, you have to have an example that both provisions the underlying infrastructure that you need to test that module that you built, in this case, just testing ourselves, dot, dot, slash, dot, dot, slash, but we provisioned a basic VPC for that test. All right, let's keep that, uh, keep that in mind now as we go over to Terraform AWS components. These are our Terraform root modules. These are also public and open source. They comprise our reference architecture. Components are a whole lot more opinionated than just a child module. And in our opinion, the best components are also pretty limited in scope. You'll see at a lot of companies that they'll combine the VPC with the EKS cluster, with the Redis database, with the RDS Aurora cluster, and that's just the first month. And then every month they're adding to that root module and it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger until that root module has also a hundred inputs like those modules I said that were bad and is very slow to plan. It takes 45 minutes to an hour to run a Terraform plan on it. Imagine when your, when your automated tests then would take that long. It's very slow to iterate and it's an anti-pattern. Okay, so we don't do that. We break it apart. So we have one root module for a VPC. We have one root module for a transit gateway, one for SFTP, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But we have another problem. <laughs> If we break our infrastructure apart like this, how do we test EKS when we don't have a VPC? Because the VPC is a different life cycle from the EKS. So now we get into a composite problem of testing components that need to work together as a system. And that's a lot more costly to test, a lot more time consuming to test in a traditional sense using something like TerraTest. And for now, I admit we don't test them that way. So how do you, this gets me back to that problem of GitOps. So GitOps is this concept where you have the desired state of your infrastructure in version control in something like Git or GitHub. And you have automation that uh, runs a Terraform plan as our CI, I put in air quotes, it's not like true, true CI, but it's a smoke test, a dry run, produces an artifact, which is your Terraform plan file. And then you do CD. So you take that, plan file and you deliver it. You deploy it ultimately to some environments. Now, the first one of those environments is your sandbox or your dev account. And that's how you validate that. Well, in one known configuration, in one account, we verified that this thing works. The problem is in reality, you have different configurations and different environments and testing all those variable combinations is costly, time consuming, and skipped by 99% of companies doing Terraform. So my two cents. There is one other thing you can do, by the way, for testing this that helps 
which is something that we do and we recommend, that of companies who practice GitOps with Terraform for their root modules that they don't do, is you run the plan in your pull request against all environments. And then you know that it's at least going to work and you know the blast radius and the impact of making that change in dev staging and production. This is why I'm really against the pattern within Terragrunt and the Terragrunt community of pinning root modules in dev staging and production because then when you make a change in dev, you are totally with blinders on what's the impact in staging and what the impact is in production until you merge that pull request and then you get to find out what the surprise is in staging. And then you get to find out what the surprise is in production when you do the version pinning strategy. So this is why I we what we do in our strategies, both for GitHub Actions, for Space Slip, is view the plan across all environments. All right, that was a long monologue. Uh, any questions from you or anyone else? No, just thank you for that. My pleasure. I mean, you have also customers who are testing this. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, <laughs> and when all of that fails, just, you know, test it with your customers. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, but uh, uh, in all seriousness, uh, this is what also really helps is the more people that use your code, the more people that are kicking the tires on it, the more battle tested it will be. Um, so, you know, if you are just uh, working in isolation, you, you don't always get that. All right. Um, any other questions about this uh, or anything else from anyone? We got another 10 minutes or so on the clock. Oh, uh, Isa was asking about, uh, has anyone tried uh, system initiative oh, in production last week? No, I think it was announced last week. Um, uh, Vlad, uh, you brought it up, I think. And you, you were very uh, bullish on it. Uh, you liked the initial um, design and construct. Yeah, I did a Twitter thread on it too. I got to use it in the preview. I talked a bunch with the team. It's super early, like it's not usable now. It's, it was a private preview. Now it's a private beta. They have only a couple of resources, like it's not usable. But mm -hmm. they seem to be getting everything right. For every single question or concern I had, they had a very, very good plan for how to tackle that. They knew where the problems were. They had the right team of people to do it. Like they have X uh, Plumy people, X HashiCorp people. I am very hopeful about its future. I praise them a bunch more on Twitter. <laughs> I can link through the thread. But yeah, it looks awesome. It's not really usable already right now, but add it to the top of your to watch list. And yeah, also my quote is on the on their website. So Disclosure. Yeah, there it is. <laughs> <laughs> I'm truly an influencer now. Yay. Yeah. yeah. Life's mission complete. Hey uh Eric, I, I wanted to is it okay if I ask a question? Yeah, yeah please go ahead. Um, I know last week we had kind of touched on, uh, you know, best practices around versioning modules. Um, uh, so we have like modules that are referencing other modules and they all have, you know, a version of that TF file that have, um, basically the, requ the required version for all these things. But in a lot of cases, you know, we're combining these things from different places and, Every once in a while, we run into these like issues where, you know, upgrading this one module breaks that one, but we need a newer version for this other one. Um, I was trying to find uh, just like some kind of like best practice guide around like this is the tried and true way of like how to use versions.tf across all of your parent, and child, and root modules. I was just curious if you could point me to anything or or like wanted to briefly talk about how you guys handle that. Yeah, uh, I can talk about our uh, lessons learned um, the hard way. Um, now, this was a number of years ago, and uh, we uh, 
you know, eight wholesale or subscribe to wholesale the whole, you need to strictly version pin your modules um, as precisely as makes sense uh, within your modules and sub modules. And I think it was with the Terraform 0 0.12, 0 0.13 to 1.0 move, uh, we fell hard when uh, this happened. Or maybe I think it was the 0 0.12 to 0 0.13 uh, move. So if you follow the practice of strictly pinning using strictly versions.tf or like the versions um, uh, in there, you have this real big problem where if you have modules that call other modules within your own ecosystem, that you can't run your tests because that other module is strictly pinned at versions. So you uh, so you have to first upgrade that other one. And we, we decided that uh, lower bound pinning for modules was the only scalable way because otherwise we would have to open up twice the number of pull requests for every uh, module we wanted to test. That's because we had to, uh, it was something, I forget exactly the order of operations. We had to first open a pull request for our module to test it, then open a pull request in the other repo to bump it up, then have our module use that other branch to, <laughs> to, to test that it would work and that you can't do that in an automated fashion. And it also broke down because we were using renovate bot everywhere and updating PRs and it didn't work. So lower bound pinning helps. Uh, so, and, and, and real quick, just yep. terminology wise, like, can you like discuss like, uh, I, I think I know what you mean, but just, just to confirm, like, what's the difference between a root, um, a parent and a child module? Like, uh, yeah. So a root module is the module that you call, you run Terraform apply in. Uh, that's the one that gets provisioned. That's the one that needs to have a Terraform state backend. That's the one that has state, therefore, by definition, and um, uh, often calls what are called child modules. When you have a child module, the thing that calls the child module, I'm just calling the parent. I didn't even realize I used the term parent, but if I did, that's what I meant. You, you may not have. That may have been something that my team uses. Okay. So yeah, the parent would not necessarily be the root module though, because a root module can call a child module that can call a child module that can call a child module. So you could imagine that the preceding module that invoked the, uh, the child module, that would be the parent module. And the parent module may or may not have state. So now if we go into uh, Cloud Posse's uh, examples, let me show you uh, what I mean, how we are pinning and it's a lesser evil. I'm gonna give you a mitigation though. Uh, so I'm not done on uh, this topic. So the first thing is this, is that we're doing lower bound pinning with one exception. We do lower bound pinning until lower bound pinning doesn't work. So what do I mean by that? Uh, new Terraform provider release. Uh, we can't upgrade the mo module yet. We don't have time. Now we open a PR to uh, put an upper bound that has to be less than some Terraform AWS provider version, for example. Uh, recent examples of this would be with um, uh, the S3, uh, due to uh, breaking changes with the S3 resource in the um, AWS V5 provider. Okay, so what is the best practice then? Uh, I'm not sure if I can articulate this as well as somebody else uh, doing this more day to day. Um, but the 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 running suggestion now is to use the lock files in the root module, or you do strict pinning in your root modules for the versions that you need. Because theoretically, the root modules are the ones that you can control. We still run into some problems with that. I feel like uh, as an open source publisher of uh, root modules as well. So in our root modules, we are not strictly pinning the providers because then that's also strictly pinning it for our customers. And um, you know that, that also limits um, uh, which providers they uh, are using. So I think that the best compromise is the lock file 
But the lock file itself is a um, complicated topic. And I guess I for, I was going to post this, I thought, in the, in the announcements, but I forgot to. There's a, uh, a, a lengthy write-up uh, by Maxime here, also in Weekly TF, happens to be uh, working for one of our customers. Um, this talks about um, how to uh, work and manage uh, the Terraform lock files. And if I, uh, if I remember correctly, one of the biggest pain points with the lock files is these checksums are architecture specific. So if you have people on WSL, people on, um, on uh, M1s, on uh, Intel Max, on Linux, uh, on AMD, et cetera, the list goes on and on, the lock file checksums are going to vary. So it gets tricky uh, trying to do it at some sort of a scale. Ideally, you are doing this through GitOps. So really only the lock files you care about are the, the Linux ones. And this is also another uh, vote uh, uh, or, you know, or another strength of uh, our tool project called Judisic. Judisic is a uh, toolbox image, a Docker toolbox image. It's uh, inspired by Core OS, which was the first OS that I used that kind of came with its own toolbox images. I don't know if it came from somewhere else before that. But the idea is you create a, a tool chain in a Docker image that everyone on your team uses, and then you won't have these kinds of uh, issues uh, because all of the um, checksums generated would be the same for regardless. Obviously, that means you're using emulation on some platforms, though. Yeah, I, yeah, I think this makes a lot of sense. Or like, you know, you let letting uh, something like Spacelift, uh, you know, do all the applies. Then yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Oh, okay, uh, cool. Yeah, and and it seems like the docs don't say that you need to have those, you know, required version that code block like in the root module. But I've found that a lot of times uh, that you need it in the child module and the root module. Yeah, it's uh, the intersection of both, I believe. Okay, okay, got it. Um, and the, the root cannot override the child. And if the child has an incompatible version, uh, it errors out. And the, um, oh, uh, just one thing. Uh, Jeremy White, can you uh, make a note that we need to fix the uh, screen, the uh, recording here? This stopped working for some reason on um, Judy 6 uh, demo here. Oh, yeah, you got it. Um, yeah, so I kind of like the lock file idea. The reason why I like it is that it's more fluid. It ensures that you can have consistent plan and applies in all of your environments using the same dependencies, provided you have a mechanism of preserving the lock file. So I think the most important thing is to preserve the lock file that you started with in dev and then promote that through to production so that you're at least using the same providers in all environments at the time you go to release it. And you can cache that lock file as an artifact if you're not committing it. Got it. Yeah, no, this is helpful. Thank you. Cool. Well, thank you all for the questions today. We are at time for office hours. Uh, we are going to be posting a recording of this session to our YouTube channel. So if you haven't yet uh, subscribed, go to youtube.com slash cloud posse to subscribe. The recording should be posted in a few hours. Um, our uh, Slack team is uh, free and public. Uh, go to slack.cloudposse.com. Uh, we have archives of everything going back since like 2016, 2017 or something. Uh, it's a great treasure trove of real life problem solving uh, by, by all our community members. We have a live office hours registration link by going to cloudposse.com slash office hours. Again, cloudposse.com slash office hours.
Give us your email. We'll send you an invite. Uh, it'll be added to your calendar. That way uh, you can uh, easily remember to join us every week. If you can't make our office hours, we syndicate it to podcast.cloudposse.com. Again, podcast.cloudposse.com. Uh, so you can listen to it however you listen to podcasts. I think we syndicate it to like 15, 20 different platforms. Um, LinkedIn, connect with me at linkedin.com slash in slash Osterman. Uh, I like to connect with everyone here in the community. And finally, if you're really curious about Cloud Posse, now's your chance. You can book a time with me directly by going to cloudposse.com slash quiz, answer a few quick questions, uh, treat it as a free consultation just to kind of get to know each other. We'll show you what we can do. We can uh, give you some suggestions on uh, where you can go and take your infrastructure uh, if you wanted to. Thanks, everyone. See you all next week. Same time, same place.